All right, what's up everybody? This is Lee coming to you from the beautiful Orange Peel venue here in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. Today we've been invited out by the guys in the Jim Blossoms to interview Robin Wilson, the lead singer. And so uh, we're gonna go inside and, uh, and talk to Robin about the past, the future, and everything that happened in between. Let's go. This is Lee from Guitar Wishes, and today we are here in Asheville, North Carolina, at the Orange Peel with Robin Wilson, lead singer of the Gin Blossoms. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well. All right, thank you so much for sitting with us today. My pleasure. Cool. Well, uh, first off, how's the tour? How's everything going? Pretty good. You know, the band is playing well. Mm -hmm. We sound good. Those are key factors they, to my they happiness. They do help. So, uh, we've been selling tickets, and... Uh, you know, it's good work if you can get it. Absolutely. And not much longer left on this run? Just a few more shows, and then uh, finally things are gonna slow down for us. We've done about 110 shows this year, mm -hmm. and I feel like I've hardly been home at all, so. Yeah. So probably gonna take a few months off and just chill at the house, right? Well, there's a few, a few fly dates here and there. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited about Halloween. Oh yeah? Yeah, that's a big one for me. Is it really, what a, are you gonna do? Do a full, like, haunted house at my place. Sweet. Smoke machines and uh, strobe lights everywhere, and blasting punk rock music, and <laughs> scare the piss out of the neighborhood kids. <laughs> Don't get much fun. Jumping out from behind bushes and stuff. I, I, <laughs> I really get excited for Halloween. Are you still in Tippy? No, I live now on Long Island, New York. Wow. So, mm -hmm. yeah, which is very, very different from Tempe. So any any big festivals you're looking at next year, it's gonna take some time off. Well, I'm sure we'll have plenty to do, but so far there's really nothing on the books yet. Yeah. And that's okay with me because I'm trying to make time for my, uh, for the other band that I play with. And I, I, I want to be able to spend more time with them. So right. the, the Smithereens. Right. Right. So I got two shows with them coming up in January. Right. And I'm hoping to do more. I've only done about 20 shows with them this year. I'm hoping to do more than that next year. Right. But Jim Blossoms are always getting in the way of my side project. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> well, you know, yeah. talking about the Jins, man, uh, let's go back to 87, 88. You know, you, you yeah. come in as a rhythm guitar player. A lot yeah. of people don't know that. You originally come in as a, a rhythm guitar player. Yeah, I was, and I was not very good. I, I wasn't much of a guitar player. And so I was way out of my league. But they would let me s sing lead on like two songs. And then the right. next gig, I was singing lead on like six songs. And by the third show, I was singing on like 12. And then a few weeks went by and Jesse came to me and said, we're just gonna switch. <laughs> and I think it had as much to do with my lack of ability on guitar as it did with my uh, dynamic lead singer ability. So, uh, yeah, well, Jesse's just, a great singer in his own right. He's a great singer, and you know the, the the reason I got the job and that they were willing to accept me as a rhythm guitar player is because mm -hmm. the way our voices blended. Right from the first moment Jesse and I ever sang together, it was it was awesome, yeah. and everybody in the room was like, "Holy, sh sh we're on to something here." Yeah. So uh, that's really, I think, one of the one of the key factors of the Jim Blossom sound is that our two voices oh, blended together. So. Absolutely, and you you look at the time that uh, New Miserable came out, you know, you're looking at 92. Um, you know, music was dominated at that time by grunge. And a lot of times you got, I've heard Jim Blossoms get, you know, uh, thrown in with grunge. And I've never understood that because when I was listening to you guys, cause I was a you know, big fan, still am, but they, uh, I always thought of you guys as anti-grunge. You know, you had a, a great, um, a great sound that countered all the stuff coming out of Seattle. And around that time, there were a lot of bands from Tempe. Yeah. You had the same kind of thing we had going a on. Great scene for a while. Yeah. At one point in like 94, there were seven bands in Tempe with major label deals. It's And uh, it, w it was a really fun, really exciting scene that we, that we had there. And it didn't have quite the, the scope or scale of like Seattle or Austin, but. Uh, we were on to something really cool. There really was refreshments. And, you know, I, yeah, refreshments, uh, a Dead Hot Workshop. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and before us, uh, you know, uh, Phoenix Band and Meat Puppets were were a big deal around mm -hmm. town. And so we all looked up to them. And it was really cool. A couple of years ago, we and the Meat Puppets were both inducted to the Arizona Entertainment Hall of Fame. Really? So that was a super cool deal for me. 
uh, to be inducted at the same time as uh, my heroes. Meat Puppets, here I have a Meat Puppets tattoo here. Yeah. This is Paradise. And uh, so I love and respect them and right. was always proud to be a part of the, the same scene. Uh, I never really heard us get compared to grunge, but you know, it was just that's just timing. That's just yeah. people that don't really know. I used to joke that we were the first post alternative band. Right. And uh, like DJs would ask me, you know, I'd be doing radio interviews. You know, what kind of what 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 is your sound? What are what are you guys? And I'd say, you know, with as much sarcasm as I could, <laughs> we're the first post alternative band and these DJs would just fly right over. Mm, I see, yeah, I get that, you know. Well speaking of labels, you are actually uh, voted uh, you know most talented unsigned band at one time, I think it was. No, it? that's not true. There was a rumor that we got an award for that. There was a rumor. That's that was a not rumor. what happened. We were chosen as the only unsigned band to participate in the New Music Awards ceremonies okay. in New York City. Okay. Hey, leave us alone! <laughs> and uh, so we went and did this show, you can, you can find it on YouTube, mm -hmm. and uh, Penn Gillette was the host. Oh yeah. And uh, he made, in our intro, he said these are the only unsigned band on the bill, so you know, pay attention and somehow it got out that we got an award but we we never did but you know it but at least to have been referred to for a while as right. the best unsigned band in America well that's pretty that's like being the best amateur skateboarder in America or <laughs> something that's pretty cool well look at and looking at the lineup I was looking at the uh, this you know there's so many songwriters yeah. in Jim Blossoms yeah. you know uh, oh, yeah. Jesse, <laughs> Jesse, of course, you write, uh, even Bill, Bill, one of the best bass players out there, uh, doesn't yeah. get the recognition he deserves. That's true. But he's, uh, he's a songwriter as well. So he is. I actually have some of his lyrics here. He wrote a fabulous song for our last record um, called Mega Pond King. Mm -hmm. And it was really one of the high points of the record when he came up with these lyrics. Originally, he had me singing... Uh, fa la la, na na na, and stuff like that. And right. I'm like, dude, I, I really hate singing la la la's. You know, sure. can, can we write some lyrics? And he's like, I got it. He, he <laughs> didn't want me to didn't want me to touch his song. <laughs> so he came up with these fantastic lyrics, and it's like the very last moment on the record. It was real, real high point. And mm -hmm. you know, I Bill's bass playing for many years always confused me because it's somewhat unorthodox, yeah. but there was a summer that he couldn't play with us several years ago. And over the course of the summer, we had like seven different guys step in, you know, guys from bands like Smash Mouth and Sugar Ray and yeah. F Fastball. And we had like seven different guys over the course of the six months that Bill was away. And every one of them said, Bill is one of the best. He just is. And it? so I remember I called Bill and I told him that, and he was, he was, it really warmed up his heart. So uh, he, he does deserve credit, especially on the last record. I think he was the MVP. He really played incredibly well. And he was inspired to perform with Don Dixon, our producer. Mm -hmm. Don is a bass player. So Bill was really looking forward to his alone time with Don. Yeah. And once we got the drums down, Bill and Don would spend the first two hours of every day to, together. Yeah, he had a great uh, he had a great song on Major Lodge Victory also. Uh, uh, yeah, he's he's he's, had a few, he's, yeah. he's always turned in pretty solid stuff, and he and I have often written together. And well, with so many songwriters in the band, uh, do you all write separately and bring it to the band, or do you get together in a room and just everybody's got ideas? How does that work? It's it's a number of different ways. Generally, yeah, we sort of go off into our own little worlds. Um, for the last record, Bill and Scott worked very closely together. Jesse writes with his partner, Danny Wild, of mm -hmm. the Rembrandts. Right. So all of Jesse's music for the last record was co-written with Danny. And I I just challenged myself to come in with a, a batch of songs that were completely self-written. And I was already after that to collaborate with my bandmates, but everybody was like, we got enough. 
right. we got enough. But it was real important to me on the last album to show up with a solid batch of songs that I had conceived of and written entirely by myself. So. Right, mixed reality. That's that's a great album. I, I, I like it a lot. Um, there's been a lot of really good Jim Blossom stuff come out starting in 2006 with Major Lodge Victory. You had uh, No Chocolate Cake in 2010 and now this one. Uh, Oh, really good albums. Not bad. And uh, we did okay. I think Mixed Reality is far superior to our previous work, going all the way back to New Miserable Experience. Mm -hmm. I think it's the only album we've made that's really on that level. But uh, we, there's a lot of good songs in you know on our records, but just not. I think Mixed Reality is the only album that really holds up from beginning to end. It does. It with really does. New Miserable Experience. Yeah, those out there, if you have not checked out the newest album, please do so. Mixed Reality. And go back, do check so. out. Please. Uh, no Chocolate Cake was great too. And of course, Major Lodge Victory in 2006. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to uh, 96. Okay. And congratulations, I'm sorry. That's All right. That album title. That was Bill. Bill usually, uh, he's, he's very clever with words, mm -hmm. turn of a phrase. But that was a reaction to what people were saying to us at the time, because we had just achieved all this success. New Miserable Experience was double platinum, four hit singles, and then right at that time was when Doug Hopkins committed suicide. Right. And so people were saying to us, literally, congratulations on all your success and I'm really sorry about your friend we were yeah. hearing those things all the time in the same sense and so that's how Bill Bill came up with that and you know that album was really challenging there's really no more pressure that can ever be put on a band sure. than to follow up a multi-platinum debut right to start from scratch and write a record that's going to compete with something that was that successful. It's an right. incredible amount of pressure. Right. And so we, we more or less pulled it off. We finished the album, or we thought it was done. Yeah. And then the label called and said, nope, you need another hit single. And they were perfectly clear that it had to be a hit single. And that was the moment really where we were under as much pressure and exterior influence as we were ever going to be in our entire career and so the labels waiting and we came up with follow you down wow. so i think of that maybe as our single greatest accomplishment right to to face down that pressure and cough up a, a classic song it went on to be a top 10 single. We did it on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. Tonight you're gonna hear everyone out there sing along on that on that tune. And it's a, it's a major success. I think it was yeah. maybe the, the biggest moment of success. Especially written under the pressure you guys were under. It, especially, yes. So, um, and it wasn't too long after that. Was, was part of the pressure the reason you guys uh, kind of called it quits and not well, accept it's part of you know it wasn't so much that the pressure as it was just we we just weren't getting along and we were you know it was so it's such a strange thing to succeed like that and we came from an alternative background where all of our favorite bands were groups like the smithereens and the replacements and so we had outsold all of our heroes and accomplished more than we ever really expected and it, you, it's sort of, uh, it's confusing. And within the group, we all have different rock and roll ethics and standards and sure. our own influences. And we just weren't on the same page emotionally. And, you know, there were, uh, there was one moment in particular, I remember it sort of sums it up for me. We were being offered a lot of money, a lot of money to license one of our songs to a Japanese cigarette commercial. And this tore the band up. No, we just, we were all over the place on how to handle this right. and what we should do about it. And it was just, 
a confusing moment for us and we didn't want to feel like we were selling out we wanted to succeed but we didn't know exactly where those two concepts met sure and so we were just we were unhappy we weren't really getting along and you know at the time I was in a cover band with a couple of my oldest and best friends and I had always wanted to be in a band with them mm. so I just thought well I'm gonna I'm gonna strike out on my own I'm gonna go do my own thing with my buddies I'm was that create the, a rock and roll utopia was and, that the gas giants yeah that was gas giants and you know I went into it trying to make everything equal I gave everybody equal shares of my publishing but it just blew up in my face. It just didn't didn't work. And musically, I think we made a pretty fantastic record. It was a great album. But it was just it, it was bad timing. Uh, rock and roll was was not really happening in like ninety eight, ninety nine. It was all about Britney Spears and In Sync. Right. The only rock bands on the charts were like Creed and Filter. Right. You know, so it was just a strange time for rock and roll. I was going to ask about the single to that. Uh, I hope my kids like Marilyn Manson. You know, um, was that tongue in cheek? Oh yeah, totally. Uh, but it was also true. You know, I, I meant it as well because I, I I love Marilyn Manson. I always love metal, and I thought it was just kind of funny to wish one, that someday I I want to. I want a kid that's all metal, you know. <laughs> and it turned out that worked out actually. I, my my son is going to be 18 in a couple of days, really? and he's a total rocker. That's awesome. And does he play? Yeah, he's a really good guitar player. And so, uh, you know, that that was song was sort of prophetic, you know. And there was a lot of moments on that record where I was sort of trying to be tongue in cheek, you know, like the sure. song of uh, stinking up the charts. Right. You know, I was basically right. just singing about trying to make it, trying to succeed, sure. and, uh, you know, Quitter is a really sarcastic number, for sure, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm really proud of that, that record, but it, it, you know, it just didn't, it didn't quite succeed commercially. And and I'm sure you guys were having offers to play left and right. We were, and so, when, the, right when the Gas Giants finally fell apart, Blossoms were getting all these offers, to perform, and I had I had written a song that ended up on uh, Major Lodge Victory. Uh, I had just finished writing a song called uh, "Come On Hard," right? And I played it for a friend of mine, and he said, "That's a Jim Blossom song," and it was a friend that I really respected, and th that was right when we were getting all these offers and. Yeah, I'm here with you, Tony, Shut up. And so I, 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 you know, became very open to the idea of reuniting with, with, with Jim Blossoms. And it was definitely the right thing to do. We were playing the other night, and I'm like, oh, we don't really sound like any other band, you know? Well, the thing is, you never change your sound. You never change, try to change with the times to do anything yeah. else. You have uh, remained unapologetically Jim Blossoms yeah. from day one. Yeah. And I think that, you know, in my opinion, that has helped with the success that you still have. I, I would agree, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And, uh, you know, fr a close friend of mine was a big guitar player in Phoenix back in the day, and he was in mostly metal bands, but he would try whatever the new trend was. He was he was shooting for that. You know, the Black Crows appeared on the scene, and next thing you know, he's in a band that's sort of like the Black Crows. And he was super talented, but he was always just swinging for the fences and following whatever trends were happening. And I saw him in like 94 sometime, and he said, you know what, I, I wish I had just stayed with you know where my heart is in music and I wasn't always trying to follow you know whatever the you know the latest thing was on MTV mm -hmm. and he said that's one thing I respect about you guys and that, that was a significant moment for me because it was the first time it was ever articulated to me and I always knew that that's what we were doing right. and that we were uh, not subject to a great deal of external pressure we we followed our own instincts, we always have, yeah. and 
Yeah, um, you write, so you write what you are. You know, you, yeah. you, anything anything else is unauthentic. So you know, the, everything I've ever heard, even the newest album, of course, Mixed Reality, is is uh, authentically Jim Blossoms. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. So and go we, figure. We got we got we got lucky. We're all in the right place. Uh, we needed each other. You know, we all wanted to be musicians, but I don't think any one of us in the band would have reached our full potential if it hadn't have been for the group. You know? right. I was a bedroom songwriter. I was always doing open mic nights and I had songs and I wanted to start a band, but I hadn't gotten around to it yet. There, there must be no cooler feeling in the world than to uh, sit down with your with your son and kind of pass on the stuff that you've learned to him and watching him yeah. take it in and really be excited about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It, you, you're really onto something there. It, it, being able to share my greatest passion with my son is so awesome. My dad was a stuffy Republican accounting professor. We had virtually nothing in common. And, you know, I don't know how many times he would come into my bedroom and I'd be in there lip syncing Kiss records or whatever. He just, how can you listen to this crap? <laughs> you know, it's, there was, there was never really a moment, at least when I was a teenager, where he was like, that's a good song. You know, what is it? Or why do you like this music? It was, it was just, just completely dismissed yeah. as, you know, something valid. And so when my son comes to me and he says, Dad, I, I heard a song the other day. I think you guys should cover it. And I'm like, all right, this is going to be good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he came, he had heard a song um, from a group called The Records called Starry Eyes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, holy crap, of course I know this song. And I, we used to cover that in Gas Giants, Gray. I mean, it, it's so perfect that he, he now he really knows my taste. Yep. And like I said, being able to, to share that with him is, is really great. So and you I, did another great cover, Strutter, on the, oh yeah. the Kiss album. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool that's, too. That's a great, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's that's cool. great, man. You talk about legacy. Uh, Jim Blossoms is going to be your legacy in the music world, mm -hmm. but your real legacy is going to be the music passed on to you. Your son. That's yeah. the coolest thing. That is true, you know. And you know what I've come to realize, though, is that the only evidence we're going to leave behind in the future is going to be on YouTube. It's that's that's the final <laughs> sort of repository of our lifetime's work. Wow. That's mm -hmm. it. I tell you, man, uh, it's been an honor to see you and talk to you. Um, I can't thank you enough, Robin. It's been my pleasure, thank too. You very, nice very to much. You, nice to meet you. Yeah. And, Cheers, um, everybody. <laughs> our extra special thanks to Hillary, to Scott, and of course to Robin Wilson from the Jim Blossoms for the incredible time they showed us down at the Orange Peel in Asheville, North Carolina. They really made us feel at home, gave us total access to the place, and uh, that, that interview was really candid. A uh, great interview there with Robin. So thanks to everybody involved with that. And uh, don't go anywhere because coming up after this, Rob is going to give us a tour of the stage and show us the equipment that they're using on tour these days. So uh, if you want to know more about Guitar Wishes, check out guitarwishes.com. Check out our Facebook site. And of course, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And smash that notification bell so you're informed of new content uploaded daily. For everybody here, I'm Lee. We're out. So what we got here? Well, Jesse's got this cool little Martin that he picked up last year and he plays that on a few songs. His girlfriend just bought him that Gretsch for his birthday, so um, he's been playing that quite a bit. And then I've never seen, oh yeah, that Bronson, that uh, red Strat looking thing is from a guitar, a luthier in uh, Phoenix that we've known for years. And uh, so I guess that's his, one of his, so. Is this yours? Uh, one of my one many of, yeah. tambourines. And then, uh, let's see, what we got for Bill? 
I don't know much about bases. So we've got a, a Jaguar base here. Oh yeah. So isn't he the hipster? <laughs> yeah. so, I, lo I love the vault. Just we just got the, the vault not too long ago. That's awesome. But let me take you up stage. You can see the pedal boards and stuff. So here's uh, Jesse's rig these days. He's playing uh, the, the twin and this Jaguar. And Scotty has the Jaguar. Oh, Generally a lot of clean tones uh, coming out of these guys. This is not Jesse's. This, this from, no, this is from the opening act. Yeah, this, these, this stuff here is opening act. But this guitar is super special. Jesse got this, it's a custom shop Strat from like 92 or 93, like when we first started making money, Jesse went and bought this, and this is one of the most solid Stratocasters on planet Earth. And Jesse's been playing it all these years, and I remember the first time I ever picked it up, I remember it was like getting behind the wheel of a Corvette or something, it was a car that was way too fast for me. That is, that is a great guitar, it's been on all of our records. Jesse some affection. Mainly a strat guy. Every time I've ever seen him. Generally, he's yeah. You know, I mean, he's, you know, he's gone through phases. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes he's out here with the telly. And in the early days, he used to like Les Pauls, but then he just gave up on those, you know. I think that tends to happen to a lot of guitar <laughs> yeah, players. Yeah, absolutely so, it does. You know, here's Jesse's uh, rig. Um, you know, they, Scotty and Jesse pick out the pedals, and then they just had our guitar tech put together these pedal boards. So this bit over there is for Jesse's acoustic sound. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I don't really understand how Jess, Jesse and Scott dial in their sounds and stuff. It's very unorthodox, and it's different from the way normal or most other guitar players sure. like work. So, um, there Works you go. For Works for him. Yep. So, this is my rig here. I love the Fender Acoustasonic amp. This is awesome, and I I prefer having an amp with me on stage. And I'm, I play acoustic guitar in about a third of the show these days. Okay. And I much prefer uh, having an amp. And I just got a couple of pedals there. I always I always like chorus on acoustic guitar. Going back to uh, uh, live record that Graham Parker back in 1980 was a big influence on me and he had a really high, a lot of chorus on his guitar so I've always liked to put a chorus on my acoustic. So, but this amp, that's a, that's a great... How long have you had that? It's so about three years now. Yeah, it, it, this is uh, one of the first ones. As soon as they started making these, I asked our friend Billy Siegel at Fender to, to set me up. So. Um, this guitar, also Fender Acoustic. I, I exclusively play Fender Acoustics on stage, and they take really good care of me. So, shout out, many thanks to our good friends at Fender. So, That's awesome. Yeah, let's see what we got for Scotty. Um, his, here's his pedal board over here. You met the guy who, what are these pedals? Um, J and, what are they called? J and something. JHS. JHS. All right, so we met that guy. He came to one of our gigs, and all of a sudden, Jesse and Scotty were all about his pedals. You know, once they once they met him, yeah. they had to start playing that stuff. So I don't know what all's going on here. So he's got a tremolo. Oh yeah. Okay, he breaks that out a few times every show. I think these you are play, all just um, distortion. You play Into the World live. We haven't played that song live in a long time. Yeah. And so, uh, and then then back here we got Scotty's rig. Also, he, Scotty also plays a Jaguar, and right now he's playing the Deluxe Reverb. And back home, Scotty collects like little tweed amplifiers. He's got a collection of old Rickenbacker amplifiers. He loves those little little tweed vintage amps. So he's got a bunch of those at home. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for showing us, man. It's My pleasure. It's amazing. It really is. My pleasure. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna sing to these people here. All right. <laughs> Yes, 
just keeps pressing me by.